Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, San Diego school officials are facing tough decisions about budget cuts tonight. And hotel owners approve a room tax to expand the downtown convention center. But is it legal? KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. Joanne Farian is on vacation. 92% of San Diego's hotel owners voted to approve an increase in room taxes. The money would pay for an expansion of the San Diego Convention Center. The tax is expected to raise nearly $36 million over 30 years. The city of San Diego will pitch in another $3.5 million a year. Uh, we see this as an investment, so uh, if this money weren't to come in, we would actually be pretty far in the hole, so we uh, expect... Uh, with the very conservative estimates that we've made that the city's TOT will go up dramatically. TOT stands for Transient Occupancy Tax, the hotel room tax. City Council still has to approve the proposal. Then a judge will be asked to determine if the funding plan is valid. Mayor Sanders says he expects to break ground on the convention center expansion later this year. A Camp Pendleton Marine has been arrested in the murder of another Marine's wife. Luis Perez had been a person of interest in the death of 22-year-old Brittany Kilgore. Investigators say he was the last person seen with her. Perez is the second person arrested in the murder. 25-year-old Jessica Lopez was arrested last week. San Diego Unified School Trustees will vote tonight on eliminating more jobs to balance next year's school budget. KPBS education reporter Kyla Calvert joins us from the News Center. We've already heard about more than 1,600 possible layoffs in the school district, Kyla. So what is the board voting on tonight? That's right. More than 1,600 teachers, librarians, counselors, nurses got notices in March that they could be laid off. And tonight the board will consider sending similar notices to about 975 classified staff. And classified staff include people like bus drivers, cafeteria workers, office clerks, classroom aides. And actually about a third of these notices, or more than a third, would go to people who work in the school's preschool programs. And teachers and parents were rallying before the meeting to protest those cuts specifically. But all of these notices, a total of about uh, 2,600, are part of the district's plan to cover a $122 million projected, projected shortfall for the fall. And what does voting to send out these notices actually mean? Well, it means that the district has until May 15th to finalize the teacher layoffs and the positions they would vote on eliminating tonight, that would be final as of June 30th. So the district has until June 30th also to finalize its budget and all of the projections that the district is using right now are based on the state budget proposal that was put forth by Governor Jerry Brown in January. So between now and the end of June, you know, a couple things are going to happen. The governor will uh, present a revised budget proposal in May, which could change the school's financial outlook. And the state legislature will, hopefully by the end of June, approve a final state budget. And it isn't until that final state budget is in place that the schools will really know how much money they're working with and how many people they can employ next year. Okay, KPBS education reporter, Kyla Calvert. A new report says nearly 80% of San Diego college students talk or text on their cell phones while driving. Researchers at UC San Diego say it's the college generation's version of driving under the influence. Half of the students in the online survey say they send texts while driving on the freeway. Of course, you can find the complete study on our website, kpbs.org. A new report says the city of San Diego is missing out on thousands of dollars each year in permit fees for sidewalk news racks. The county grand jury says there are no permits for more than a third of the racks on city streets. The fee is $15 a year. State lawmakers have turned down a measure to install the surfing Madonna at Moonlight Beach in Encinitas today. An assembly committee said... The work was religious in nature and rejected the bill by Republican Martin Garrick of Solana Beach. The State Parks Department has already said the piece can't go to Moonlight Beach because it would appear to favor one religion. A bill to expand abortion services in California got its first hearing in Sacramento today. Peggy Pico is talking about that at the Evening Edition Roundtable.
Just as a number of states around the country are enacting laws to make abortions more difficult to obtain, a proposal to expand access to abortion is making its way through committees in Sacramento. State Senator Kristen Kehoe of San Diego has introduced Senate Bill 1338. The bill would, for the first time, allow nurse practitioners, nurse midwives, and physician assistants to perform non-surgical, such as medically induced abortions, after they've completed and achieved clinical competency in a state mandated certification program. Joining me now to talk about the bill is my guest, Vince Hall. Vince is Vice President of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood in the Pacific Southwest. And Vince, thanks so much for joining us. I guess the first question would be, how much would these provisions actually change the existing law? Well, they would make a very important and significant change to existing law in that we currently allow those categories of advanced practice clinicians that you just described, the certified nurse midwives, the physician's assistants, and the nurse practitioners to provide medication abortion. This bill would allow them to also provide, during the first trimester, a non-surgical aspiration abortion. And that is, has been proven to be safe and effective. It is uh, the safety of those practitioners providing the service has been proven by a four and a half year long study done by the University of California in partnership with the state of California. And when, so that's the change. When we're talking about aspiration abortions, just to be clear, we're talking about uh, it, it's, it's the most I, I don't want to say popular, but the most used certainly type, most common, most yes. common type of uh, abortion, and it happens before 16 weeks. Yes. Well, this bill would limit the availability of the procedure from a advanced clinician to just the first uh, trimester. Second trimester procedures obviously have more complications to them. It requires more skill, and that is reserved for medical doctors. Currently, under California law, only medical doctors can provide that procedure in the first trimester. Other states uh, have shown that these clinicians can provide that safely. The study that's been done over the last five years here in California has shown through 18,000 procedures that these clinicians can perform the procedure very safely. Uh, patient satisfaction is very high when receiving this procedure from clinicians. So it is a logical next step because it addresses a very significant problem in California, which is that more than half of our counties don't have a single abortion provider. And so you have many women who have a constitutional right to choose, but they don't have any practical access to an abortion provider. And is that why Planned Parenthood has been running ads on the radio and also on YouTube? I want to take a look at that ad right now. So let, let's take a look at it and then mm -hmm. let's talk about um, why the support for this. Certainly. I'm asking for your help to pass two very important bills coming before the California legislature this week. Both are critical to women's health. If passed, they'll increase access to comprehensive reproductive health care. You can help by urging our state senator, Juan Vargas, to stand with Planned Parenthood in supporting this legislation. Okay, so again, a, a push for it, an area, a population of people who don't have access. In San Diego County, is that a real problem? Uh, it is a problem more particularly in rural counties, and uh, certainly Senator Vargas represents all of Imperial County. He represents a piece of the Coachella Valley in Riverside County, and uh, his constituents would directly benefit from his support of this legislation. He currently has not announced his position on the bill. There is a critical vote coming up this Thursday in the State Senate Business and Professions Committee, and so it is our hope that the citizens of San Diego and the other parts of the Senator's District will contact him to let him know that they support this critical step toward improving a woman's access to reproductive choices. Now, there is some opposition. Assemblyman Brian Jones of the 77th Assembly District, that's the San Diego's East County, said, quote, my immediate response when I heard about this bill was visceral. I felt like I was kicked in the gut. I shouldn't be shocked at the moral failure this represents, but I fear what it says about our society, that we are actually looking for more ways to abort babies. How would you respond to that sort of criticism? Well, the assembly member opposes all abortion, even in cases of rape and incest, and so his advocacy is masking his real position and his opposition to the bill. But he is in the California state legislature, and the state of California has been supervising this study for the last five years, so it certainly should not come as a surprise to anybody. But I would invite opponents of abortion to join with Planned Parenthood in making abortion less necessary by providing access to birth control and comprehensive sexuality education, because those are the only things which reduce the number of unintended pregnancies, which is the leading indicator of abortion. So I understand that there are heartfelt beliefs on both sides of, of the issue. 
our goal is to both reduce unintended pregnancy, thereby reducing the need for abortion. At the same time, we are ensuring that legal and safe abortion is available to any woman who chooses to exercise that reproductive choice. All right, it's in committee today and Thursday. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. Two former gang members who grew up in the same neighborhood are trying to turn their lives around. They're residents of San Diego's largest state-licensed drug treatment program run by the Alpha Project. In part two of our series, we show you how it's changing lives and the neighborhood once known as Tweaker Hill. I feel really good. I feel great today. God is, God is really, truly good, you know, because inside of me, I know, I, I know who I am today. I, I love me today. You can see and feel how the time spent at Casa Rafael has changed Johnny Coulter. He spent half his 46-year life in prison for gangbanging southeast of downtown San Diego. People can't see what's inside of you. You know, so when you're done, you're done. You know, if you're not, then you can keep on doing the same old things, expecting different results, which is still insanity. Coulter has gone from strong-arm robber and enforcer to peacemaker and counselor. His biggest regret? the loss of time. If I could push the reset button, I would not be missing all these years in my life. I'd be something somewhere with my family, with my children. Casa Rafael is a three-step residential rehab program. It takes nine to 12 months to complete. She's been sober 15 years now, but she runs the day center. Alpha Project's Bob McElroy says more than 80% of the graduates remain clean and sober three years after leaving the program. Oh, they get a whole perspective on reading back mm -hmm. and seeing where, they, where their stinking thinking was and how they're thinking today. Stinking yeah. thinking. Stinking thinking. He says before Casa Rafael took up residence in this renovated motel in Vista, it was known as Tweaker Hill, where crystal meth and criminal activity was all too common. So the city was so fed up with it. They asked us if we'd locate our treatment facility here. I did whatever the hell I felt like doing. Former gang member Ricky Cervantes is in his third month of sobriety. He now wants to be a role model for the young guys in his Logan Heights neighborhood. I have a lot of kids out there from my neighborhood that I call my sons, that I carry under my wing. A lot of them are dead. I didn't get to, I regret sometimes, like, I should have picked them up, took them home, you know? Stuff like that. You know, it still hurts, but uh, I love those kids, you know what I mean? Tomorrow night, we'll hear how peer-to-peer -peer counseling is key to the Alpha Project's 25-year success. The majority of its counselors are former addicts or criminals who aren't fooled by their peers. In just a moment on Evening Edition, mobile home park owners say rent control erodes their profits. Tenants say losing it could mean financial ruin, the debate over rent control in Oceanside. And the fight continues over renovation of the farmer's market in Sherman Heights. It's headed back to court. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8, what was really going on behind the stately walls and under the servant's stairs? Look beyond the fiction to the truth of how life was on Secrets of the Manor House. Then at 9, it was the year the boom went bust between the Roaring Twenties and the Great Depression. The crash of 29 on American Experience. And at 10, Frontline brings you the story of a newly elected president with a mandate for change and how he grappled with Wall Street. That's tonight on KPBS. I'm Ray Suarez. On the next news hour from Arizona, a report on the tough immigration law ahead of Supreme Court arguments later this week. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. In the last year, KPBS News has been honored with nearly three dozen awards. I'm extremely proud of these honors, and I thank you for your support as we continue to serve our local communities with award winning news coverage in the years to come. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by Buying a mobile home is one of the most affordable ways to home ownership, but there's a catch. Your house is on land owned by someone else. KPBS reporter Allison St. John says rent control gives mobile homeowners some security, but park owners 
are trying to overturn it. In Oceanside, a June ballot measure seeks to phase out rent control for the city's 17 mobile parks. One thing to get straight up front is that mobile homes are not really mobile. So the homeowner's security is inextricably tied to the owner of the land it sits on, the park owner. Linda Walshock bought a brand new manufactured home in Mission View Mobile Home Park four years ago after she suffered a series of strokes and had to stop working. We've been priced out of stick-built homes. We've been priced out of apartments. And the only option that was really available to us was manufactured homes. Walshaw paid a premium for the new house, $120,000 at the peak of the market. Because it was in a rent-controlled park, she knew she'd never be priced out. But last year, the Oceanside City Council passed an ordinance to phase out rent control in the parks. That means park owners could raise rents from a few hundred dollars a month to a thousand or more. Walshaw says her home lost value like every other house in San Diego, but without rent control, the value has plummeted. Because if they can raise the rents without limit, then no other buyer is going to want this house. I've invested my life savings in this house. I've already lost a great deal of money since I moved into it, and this will take the rest. If I lose this home, I lose everything. So who would gain? The mobile home park owners, whose profits have been gradually eroded over the years by rent control imposed back in 1984 by the city of Oceanside. City Councilman Jerry Kern, who is running for mayor this year, thinks it's time to overturn rent control. He says no one will be forced from their homes because Prop E is actually vacancy decontrol, which means the rent can only change after a homeowner sells. The existing residents do not lose rent control. They get to keep rent control as long as they live in their coach. Only after they move does it go to market rate. Oceanside passed rent control originally to provide affordable housing for its seniors and veterans. But Kern says there's no way of knowing if low-income people are the ones buying mobile homes. Because there's no means testing for mobile homes. Kern says some people use mobile homes as their second home. He argues the city has spent nearly $8 million administering the program. City staff reports suggest that number is closer to $4 million and is covered by fees paid to the city by the mobile home owners and the park owners. Curran says the city should not be supporting a program that interferes with the market and private property rights. We cannot have the city paying for a program that in essence is taking away property rights from the landowner and transferring to somebody else. It's a tricky situation, balancing the rights of the landowners with the rights of the homeowner. Mobile homeowners have rallied and put the issue on the ballot. Miramar Park resident Bob Ryan, a retired veteran, is fighting to save rent control. There are people in here that live on Social Security. That's all they live on. I mean, they get $900 a month that pays their rent, it gives them their food to live on, pays their utilities. It just, it's, it's sad that those people are going to be impacted by this. And if they're not impacted immediately, they will be within a year or two. Ryan says there are people who've tried to sell, perhaps to finance their transition to assisted living, but couldn't find a buyer willing to risk hefty rent increases. They ended up selling to the park owner for pennies on the dollar. Ryan says the park owners could raise rents as a way to force people out and then turn the land over to more profitable developments. At a recent forum on Oceanside's cable channel KOCT, Amy Epstein said that's not going to happen. Epstein is part of a family-owned mobile home park business. We're not in the development or apartment or anything, any other business like that. We're in the mobile home park business. Epstein's grandfather built some of the first mobile home parks decades ago. When vacancy decontrol passes, the owners will have a pride of ownership again. They'll want to, you know, uh, you know, create more amenities in the park and they'll want to redo the streets and, you know, upgrade the electric and, you know, fix the pools and the decks. I mean, that, that stuff costs money and right now there's not money to do it, but with vacancy decontrol, that money would be there. Epstein says several of Oceanside's parks are family operations, but most are run by large corporations, some from out of town. Park owners have poured almost $300,000 into the campaign to pass Proposition E. The Oceanside City Councilwoman who originally brought in rent control in the parks back in 1984 is Melba Bishop. She says this initiative marks a significant shift in Oceanside's politics, but she says it's about more than politics. Remember that this issue is about your mom and your dad who are living in, can live in a place where they can take care of themselves or they can come and live with you. 
The vote in June does pit one kind of property owner against another, and it will be a bellwether of the changing political climate in Oceanside. That was Alice in St. John reporting. The dispute over a new Walmart in Sherman Heights isn't over yet, despite a judge's denial of a temporary restraining order to stop construction. Community members say Walmart started tearing down the old farmer's market building without issuing proper notice. Peggy Pico is talking about that with the city councilman who represents the area. Walmart issued a statement after yesterday's ruling saying in part, it's good news when construction teams are back to work and residents are a step closer to getting what they have overwhelmingly said they want, more job opportunities and affordable grocery options in their own neighborhood. Joining me today to discuss the latest on this story is San Diego City Councilman David Alvarez. He represents District 8, where the new Walmart is planned. Thank you very much for joining me here today. Let's start with the basics. Do the residents in Sherman Heights support the Walmart store there in general? Do they want a grocery store there? Residents of Sherman Heights and of Logan Heights, because the store is really located between a couple of communities, have been asking for a long time for a grocery store, for good produce, for good quality produce. Uh, not only that, but also other amenities like a pharmacy, which is uh, also being talked about as part of the store. So absolutely, the community overwhelmingly rep, uh, is in support of a grocery store coming into the community. And to the comment that Walmart made, absolutely, it's wonderful when people are back to work and when we're building a store that people want. But the even better news, the great news would be that the community would be informed about what the proponents, what Walmart is really deciding to do in that, in that neighborhood. We, community wants to know. Well, you spoke with members of the community. You're mm -hmm. actively involved in this. What is their major concern? The major concern is that walls have begun to come down on this building, this iconic site that uh, weren't expected. Uh, there's some demolition occurring in this building that a lot of us have uh, grown up going to. It's part of the neighborhood character. And so walls started to come down last week and people got startled. And, um, and so people are just concerned that Walmart is gonna go forward with a plan that's not very transparent. The community isn't being informed as to what exactly the project is going to be. Walmart has now decided to put up a banner with an image of what the front of the store is gonna look like that's as far as they've gone. They haven't shared any real detailed plans as to what the store is going to be like. What it's really going to be. Now, did you believe personally, did you believe or were led to believe that the building was going to be intact? The, I have a public letter, uh, a letter from Walmart that states that uh, the, the iconic site is going to be maintained and enhanced. The one thing I did know, and I think everybody in the community uh, found out about, was that one of the two towers, this specific site has two towers. If you drive down the 5 freeway, you can see it. It's just uh, east of the freeway around uh, Logan Heights. Uh, one of those two towers was going to come down. We all knew that was going to happen. Uh, we did not know that entire walls uh, were going to come down and that uh, it was going to change as drastically as it has changed. And that's been the problem, really, that the community hasn't been informed. In San Diego, we've had a history of uh, great communication between the public and those who are pr uh, proponents of projects so that the projects in the end really meet the demands and the needs of the community. In this case, I think it was a poor job done on behalf of Walmart to really engage the community and let them know what was going to happen on the site. What kind of community involvement would you like to see? How would you like the community involved? Well, one of the things that Walmart could do is hold a public meeting, a public forum where, they're gonna dis where they would discuss in detail what their proposal is. One of the things that they've decided to do is go to a few individuals throughout the community and just explain it to them. Um, they pulled per permits back in last summer. The first time I heard, the council member who represents this area, the first time that I heard about this store was about two months ago. And so clearly they were moving on a path without really trying to engage the community. And so that's really what's the wrong in this whole, in this whole situation. The communication is really lacking. Do you think it's too late to win back the trust, or do you think they can win back the trust of the community? I think it's absolutely not too late. If, in fact, I've been telling Walmart um, in the press conference that was held last week in my personal conversations that let's get down uh, to business, let's engage the community, let's reach an agreement, let's all stand together uh, when you announce the store is going to be opening, the community and Walmart and civic leaders and say this is a great win-win for the community, let's do it, it's not too late. Has construction resumed and if not, what, what's next? Well, uh, the judge uh, issued a uh, 
negated the, uh, the restraining order, and so construction can resume as a result of that. Uh, I drove by today, this morning, and there is work being done in the interior of the building. I have not seen any more walls being demolished, so construction has continued. All right. Well, thank you, man. Uh, thank you so much, Councilman Alvarez. My pleasure. Thank you. But opponents of the new Walmart have filed another legal action based on the state's Environmental Quality Act. That means the issue goes back to court tomorrow morning. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Hi, I'm Yul Kwan from the new PBS series, America Revealed. Make Wednesdays your destination for exploration. First, on nature, encounter the radioactive wolves of Chernobyl. Next, Nova unlocks the secrets of our nearest star, the sun. Then, join me for America Revealed and see how we produce and deliver energy to a switched-on nation. This Wednesday, PBS is your destination for exploration. Punch you. Yes, punch me in the face. Didn't you hear me? I always hear punch me in the face when you're speaking, but it's usually subtext. Crime Fighting's most famous couple is back. We're not a couple. <clears throat> Something big's coming. A monstrous hound. Power play with the most powerful family in Britain. Oh, this is getting rather fun, isn't it? I've missed something, haven't I? The new season of Sherlock on Masterpiece, coming in May, only on PBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Last week, during a KPBS debate among San Diego's mayoral candidates, City Councilman Carl DeMaio described how the convention center downtown, the expansion there, would be funded. And this expansion will be done by private investment from the hoteliers. But Voice of San Diego fact-checked DeMaio's statement and called it huckster propaganda. As we reported earlier tonight, hotel owners voted to increase their room taxes, in other words, using public money to pay for an expansion of the convention center. The balance of the project would be paid for with money from the city and port also using public funds. On Facebook, Alyssa Gabriel writes, that is exactly what politicians said about building Petco. Hmm, not exactly. And on Voice of San Diego's website, John Osborne commented, so in DeMaio speak, if a tax is intended to help private businesses it's not a tax, but if a fee is intended to help the government, it's a tax. Of course, you can have your say by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and of course, you can email us. Re recapping some of tonight's top stories, San Diego school trustees vote tonight on eliminating almost 1,000 more jobs to balance next year's school budget. If approved, more than 2,600 district employees will be at risk of layoff. And researchers at UC San Diego say nearly 80% of college students surveyed admitted to driving while texting or talking on their cell phones, but only a quarter of them say they frequently use a hands-free device. You can get more on these stories at our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.